Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Representatives from the Chicago Police Department say that they are searching for multiple unknown suspects this week after they stole a backhoe from a construction site and used it to break into an ATM. According to reports, the incident began either late on February the 10th or early on the 11th when the thieves stole the backhoe from a construction site in Calumet Heights on the city's south side. The suspects then drove the piece of heavy machinery more than 20 miles north to a strip mall on West Morse Avenue in Rogers Park. Once inside the plaza, the unknown suspects drove the backhoe up to a Chase Bank ATM before ramming it repeatedly and breaking into it with the vehicle's jackhammer attachment. When the ATM was completely broken open and destroyed, the thieves fled, leaving the backhoe behind. While police say that the suspects did successfully break into the part of the ATM where the money is kept, it's unclear if they actually took any of the cash inside. At the current time, investigators say that they are searching for the culprits, however, no arrests have yet been made. According to reports, the bizarre incident has shocked and baffled local residents, some of whom were quoted saying that they have never seen anything like this in their lives. Others are allegedly questioning how no one could have seen or heard anything while the crime was being carried out. At the time of this recording, the incident is still under investigation. Authorities in Onslow County, North Carolina, say that two escaped inmates from Tennessee are dead this week after they were involved in a fatal crash following a high-speed car chase with police. According to reports, the incident began on the morning of February 4th when 38-year-old Tobias Carr, 45-year-old Timothy Sarver, and 50-year-old Johnny Shane Brown broke out of Tennessee's Sullivan County Jail. Representatives from the jail say that the men were able to escape after getting to the roof of the facility, which they did by climbing through an air vent that was accessible in the ceiling of their cell. At the time of the escape, Brown was in jail for multiple charges, including domestic assault, aggravated stalking, and harassment. Sarver was incarcerated for vehicle theft, identity theft, possession of drug paraphernalia, and unlawful carrying of a weapon while Carr was facing murder and other charges for allegedly stabbing his wife to death in 2019. Roughly 24 hours after the escape, Carr and Sarver showed up at a Speedway convenience store in Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina, where they robbed the clerk there at gunpoint. After tying him up and taking money from the store's register and safe, Carr and Sarver stole the clerk's car and fled. After arriving at the scene of the robbery, Investigators got a lucky break while interviewing the clerk, when he spotted Carr and Sarver driving past the convenience store again in his stolen vehicle. Police immediately followed the escaped inmates, who began to lead them on a high-speed chase. The pursuit continued south down the North Carolina coast through five counties, until finally police were able to disable Carr and Sarver's stolen vehicle in Brunswick County, just west of Wilmington. The reports don't mention exactly how the vehicle was disabled. What we do know is that it resulted in a crash that killed both of the suspects. The third escapee, Johnny Brown, was arrested without incident on February 10th in Wilmington after police received a tip about his possible location. Representatives from the Delaware State Police announced a tragic update in the case of a missing 59-year-old Philadelphia woman this week after her remains were discovered on a college campus in the city of Newark. According to reports, Kim Darlene Ezel was last seen on January 5th at her apartment on the 1700 block of Allegheny Avenue in Philadelphia. On the same day that she was reported missing roughly a week later, police were called to the residence where they discovered that her 78-year-old roommate, Stanley Lawton, had been murdered. There was no sign of Kim anywhere. When investigators spoke to the 59-year-old's worried family members, they told them that in the days leading up to her disappearance, Kim was being repeatedly harassed by her landlord's son, 31-year-old Walter Hurd. Apparently, Hurd kept asking Kim for rent money, but she said she wasn't handing over anything until she received a written lease agreement which she had asked for numerous times. According to Kim's daughter, on one occasion, 
Heard threatened that Kim was going to bring him the money or he was going to make her. A week after the murder of Stanley Lawton, Heard was arrested and charged with the crime. No additional updates about Kim's disappearance were given until this week, when on February 7th, police announced that they had found her body on the campus of Delaware Technical Community College. According to reports, the remains were discovered inside a vehicle in a fenced-in area near the back of the school. At the time of this recording, no cause of death has been reported. However, there are unconfirmed reports that a bullet was found near Kim's body. It remains unclear if her death is connected to the murder of her roommate. The situation is still under investigation. Authorities in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin say that two women are facing attempted murder charges this week after they allegedly attacked a server at a local restaurant over a missing hamburger, nearly killing him. According to reports, the brutal crime took place on January 30th at a George Webb restaurant in the city of Wauwatosa. The incident allegedly began when a group of four women started arguing with employees at the restaurant. Witnesses described them as impatient and rude and said that they were complaining that their food wasn't being served fast enough and that their server had forgotten a burger in their order. Things reportedly spiraled out of control when the women were asked to leave the restaurant leading to a confrontation at the building's front cash register. Investigators say that it was at this point that two of the women, 20-year-old sisters Brianna and Brianta Johnson, turned to violence. According to witnesses, Brianta began to punch a 26-year-old server at the restaurant before wrestling him to the ground. Once there, Brianna shot the man in the face. The women then fled the scene, though not before Brianta reportedly took one more opportunity to stomp on the critically injured victim. The man has since been identified only by the first name Anthony. Though Anthony survived the terrifying attack, it said that he sustained serious injuries to his teeth, tongue, and the right side of his face. A GoFundMe account set up by family members to help assist with his medical expenses has since raised more than $38,000. The page states that the money has so far allowed him to see an oral surgeon and that he appears to be recovering well for the most part. As for the suspects allegedly behind the attack, reports state that all four women have since been arrested. Both Johnson sisters were charged with attempted first-degree intentional homicide and made initial court appearances this week. While some reports state that charges are expected against the other two women as well, it's unclear what these charges will be. At the time of this recording, their names have not been released. Representatives from Tennessee's Cookville Police Department say that they have arrested and charged a local man this week after he was accused of murdering his 23-year-old pregnant fiance. According to reports, the case began on the afternoon of February 4th when police were called to conduct a welfare check at the residence of Lindsay Bounds. When they arrived at the 23-year-old's apartment on West 12th Street, they found her unresponsive, and it was quickly determined that she had been murdered. Shortly after that, investigators zeroed in on a single suspect, Lindsay's fiancé, Christian Luna. Though Luna apparently fled the state, he was found by authorities in the city of Karen Crow, Louisiana on February 7th and arrested for first-degree murder. Lindsay's family members say that they are shocked and devastated by the horrible crime. According to her sister, though Lindsay and Luna were going through problems in their relationship, it appeared as though they had worked things out, and no one saw anything like this coming. At the time of this recording, Christian Luna is currently awaiting extradition back to Tennessee. Authorities in Martin County, Florida say that a 38-year-old Port St. Lucie man has been arrested and is facing multiple charges this week after he allegedly made a series of terrible and baffling decisions that resulted in a trail of destruction. According to reports, the incident began in the early morning hours of February 5th when 38-year-old Bradford Weitzel left a local bar and apparently couldn't find his vehicle. While this is the point at which most people probably would have simply tried to arrange a different way home, this is not what Weitzel did. Instead, he decided to steal someone else's vehicle, a choice that he would later tell police was part of a quote, good faith effort to try and track down his missing car. 
Though it's unclear how long Weitzel drove around in the stolen vehicle, what we do know is that at some point, he ended up on some train tracks on Indian River Drive, where he claimed that the car either stalled or got stuck. Realizing that a train was coming, Weitzel bailed out of the vehicle and ran away shortly before it was struck by the train and sent flying into a nearby house. While the sleeping residents inside the house were thankfully not injured, as the Martin County Sheriff's Office pointed out in their report, quote, the explosive sound of a driverless car smashing into the side of their home was clearly jolting. After fleeing the scene of the crash, Weitzel allegedly continued the morning's antics by going to a nearby fruit stand, which he vandalized while trying to steal a forklift. He later told police that he also planned to use the forklift to search for his missing car. However, sometime during the attempted forklift theft, Weitzel apparently realized that he could simply report his missing vehicle to police, so he flagged down a couple of deputies who were responding to the car-slash-train crash and told them that he was still looking for his car. He was arrested at the scene and has since been charged with grand theft and criminal mischief, though authorities say they also expect to file additional charges. While no reports specifically mention whether alcohol played a part in Weitzel's bizarre alleged crime spree, let's just say we have our suspicions. Authorities in Albuquerque, New Mexico say that they have arrested and charged a 42-year-old man this week after he allegedly stabbed 11 people within the span of a few hours while riding around on a bicycle. According to reports, the incident began on February 13th when police were called to a crime scene at Central Avenue and 4th Street where a man had been stabbed in the hand. About an hour later, a second call came in, this time about a stabbing near the University of New Mexico, a couple of miles away. Two more stabbings were reported along Central Avenue over the next two hours, followed by a fifth call at 2 p.m. when two people were found outside of a convenience store with knife wounds to their necks. Roughly 20 minutes after that, another two calls came in. The final one involving a victim who had been stabbed outside of a restaurant along a busy street. Witnesses in that incident described a middle-aged man on a BMX bike who was wielding a large knife. The search for the suspect continued until an officer spotted someone who matched the man's description tossing something in the trash nearby. When the trash can was searched, a large knife was recovered and the man was arrested. He was subsequently identified as 42-year-old Tobias Gutierrez and was booked into Albuquerque's Metropolitan Detention Center on charges of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. According to reports, Gutierrez has a history of criminal offenses that include burglary, battery, and possession of a controlled substance. At the current time, it's unclear what motivated the stabbings. However, authorities say they believe the attacks were random. While at least two of the 11 victims reportedly suffered critical injuries, thankfully, all of them now appear to be in stable condition. This week, authorities in El Paso County, Colorado, announced that they had arrested a man in the nearly 10-year-old cold case disappearance of a 19-year-old woman after her remains were found on a farm property belonging to his parents. According to reports, 19-year-old Kara Nichols was reported missing by family members on October 14, 2012, days after she was last seen in the 6700 block of Mission Road. An investigation revealed that the aspiring model had recently been working as an escort, and her family began to fear the worst. In 2013, detectives searched Kara's cell phone records, revealing a list of eight people she had been in contact with around the time of her disappearance. One of them in particular stood out because he had been talking to Kara right before she went missing. It was a man named Joel Hollendorfer. While Hollendorfer admitted to police that he had spoken with Kara, he claimed that he had never actually met up with her. Detectives found this hard to believe, especially after Kara's cell phone record showed that on the night she was last seen alive, she had traveled to a rural property on Burgess Road. The property belonged to Hollendorfer's parents. Though police searched the Burgess Road residence at the time, no excavation was done there. Instead, police dug at another property that Hollendorfer's parents claimed that he had access to, but no remains were recovered. 
While reports do not explain why police did not dig at the first location, multiple sources cite allegations from Kara's family, who say that the initial investigation into her disappearance was mismanaged. It wasn't until the case was re-examined this year that detectives uncovered a potential new witness, Hollendorfer's ex-wife. When she was interviewed, she told police that Hollendorfer had confessed to killing Kara in 2014. She said he claimed that it was an accident and that he had hid her body on his parents' property in one of the graves where they had buried horses. When police went back to the Burgess Road residence with this new information, they were finally able to uncover Kara's remains. According to reports, Hollendorfer was arrested on February 7th and has now been charged with second-degree murder and tampering with physical evidence. That's it for this edition of Crimes of the Week. If you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.